Was that not a great way to start a service this morning? Yeah. <laughs> Just in case you're interested, I actually get here very early on Sunday mornings and on baptism Sundays, the first thing I do is check the temperature of that tub because a polar plunge could be a little bit rough on everybody. But uh, in case you're interested, it was over 90 degrees, so we're good to go. Um, one of the things that is true in any stream of Christianity is a concept that is universally accepted. You can find lots of difference in the way Christians practice their faith, but there are some things that are universally true, and today I want to talk about one of those. It has to do with confession. The question is, what are we supposed to confess? How are we supposed to go about that? And so there's a great psalm that actually talks about this. It's Psalm 32, and I'd like to begin by reading there. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely, the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And then the psalmist gives us God's response. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule. Just look at the person next to you and tell them, no horsing around. Don't, don't be like the horse or the mule, all right? Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all of you who are upright in heart. There are two things that God calls us to confess, and the first is God calls us to confess our faults. If we're going to live a life by grace, then it means that we have to be honest about the ways that we fail. And this is a real challenge for lots of people. Many of us, once we are forgiven, would prefer not to go back and, and remind ourselves or share with anyone else some of the faults and failures from our previous life. But grace calls us to be honest about all of our life, and our past is part of our story. The truth is, is that most of us would prefer not to need grace. What we would prefer is to need understanding. People just need to understand. But what is true is that we cannot comfort ourselves and other people cannot comfort us if we keep pretending. So we can say things like this, well, there's other people who are doing it. And there's other people who have done worse. And all of that is true. But I don't think that right and wrong is determined by the number of people who do it. And I don't think that just because we can find someone who's done something worse, removes our responsibility for our own actions. Some of the greatest injustices in the world were committed, were committed by a majority. I don't think that's where we want to go. Now, there are moments when we live out our values, when we live up to our morals. There are moments when we get things right, and, and that's good. There are some people who think you don't get anything right. That's a deception. There, there are things that we get that's right. But there are also times when our motives are dark and our actions are selfish 
Every one of us have had experiences like that. And to hide those latter realities releases or removes from us the possibility of a healing gift that God wants to give to us. We cannot hide. If we do, we will never experience the light. This is what uh, the gospel writer John would say. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We need to be willing to admit the inconsistencies that happen with inside of us. It is true there are times when we believe. It is also true there are times when we doubt. It is true that sometimes we hope. It is also true that sometimes we despair. It is true that sometimes we love. It is also true that sometimes we hate. And some, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most people in this room know what this next statement is. Sometimes we even feel guilty about not feeling guilty. Isn't that an amazing thing? So God calls us to live in truth. Truth about who he is, but also true truth about who I am and truth about the things that I have done or have not done. And I can be uncomfortable with that. There are parts of my life I don't want anyone to know. There are parts of my life I would prefer be kept in the shadows and in secret. And Christianity requires us to step out of the shadows. So what happens when we don't confess our sins? We, we read it earlier in Psalm 32. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. It's, it's like our bones turn to powder. We don't seem to have a way to stand. We lose strength, we lose health, we lose vitality. It's something that begins to happen when we carry around unforgiven and unconfessed sin. Our words become like groans and, and our language represents more of our frustrations and, and our, our, our disappointments and our lack of hope and our discouragements than anything else. And so God calls us to a different way to live. So who should decide what's right and wrong? If we're going to confess, who gets to make that call? Who gets to decide that? And that's something that people really get frustrated by. And, and in our culture, what we're told is, well, I'll, I'll decide for myself what's right and what's wrong. Okay. Every pain and injustice committed against you was done by someone who thought it was okay. So how comfortable are you with everybody deciding their own version of right and wrong? And by the way, when it comes to ourselves, as soon as we start establishing a standard, we actually dis, uh, establish two standards, one for us and one for everybody else, right? When I make a mistake, I need understanding and I should be forgiven. When other people make mistakes, they should pay. Uh, I don't, by the way, this is a universally true thing of every human being on the planet. So you're not exempt from it. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but this is what's true is that I don't even have to go to God's law to find every single one of us guilty. All I have to do is find a quote from you where you said about someone else, they should or they shouldn't. And the question is, do you always live up to the ways you think other people should behave? And the answer is we don't. What's also true is that if we erase our past, if, if we pretend like we've never had anything that we needed to be forgiven of, we actually deprive others of a story of grace. And if we don't, if we're unwilling to show our scars, we actually deprive other people of knowing that there's a process and a way for healing. So who gets to decide right and wrong? A lot of people think that, uh, uh, they should get to decide that, or, or maybe the culture should get to decide that. What's the prevailing concept today? And this is what I will tell you is that the culture can change the rules of engagement, but the culture doesn't change the consequences of our actions and the pain it causes in other people's lives. 
We're the most medicated culture in the history of humanity. What pain are we trying to subdue? And it goes right to this issue. So we can believe we have the right to make the rules, but God actually says we need an outside source and we need someone who is righteous and we need someone who's consistent and we need someone who is loving. And outside of that, our heart just condemns us. But with that, we have a way forward, a way to experience forgiveness. So how do we hide our sins? That's a good question. One is we blame. It's the very first thing humans did. When Adam and Eve fell, the first thing they did is start blaming each other and even blaming God. Sometimes what we do is we point to someone else's greater sin. Well, I know what I did is, is not right, but what they did is far worse. That's a way of hiding. Sometimes we avoid feedback. We'll just avoid people who might call us on something. And, and sometimes we'll just rationalize. We can find a, a logical argument as to why what we did was okay. And sometimes we'll just outright lie and deny. I never did it. Didn't happen. Don't know what you're talking about. But the Psalm said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And here's the thing I want you to hold on to today. Confession does not increase God's love for us. It increases our love for God. Confession does not increase God's love for us. He already loves you with an everlasting love. Nothing you say or do or don't say or don't do can change God's love for you. But when we practice confession, our love for God grows. If you're feeling a little bit disconnected from God, maybe consider the practice of confession. See, people who think they don't need to be forgiven of anything are rarely loving. They tend to be judgmental. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you know anybody like that because you might be sitting next to them. People can be judgmental. Unforgiven people tend to be unforgiving. Unforgiven people tend to be unforgiving. When we know we have been forgiven much, we wind up loving much. Now, this is not a call to, to commit greater sins, okay? Just go out and do worse things so that you can really feel loved by God. That's not what it is. It's a call to see our, the weight of our sins accurately. And we are so good at at reducing and diminishing the impact of our actions, our attitudes, our words in the life of our uh, families and our neighbors. So Jesus actually once told a religious person who was very upset with Jesus, uh, there was this woman who was washing his feet and the religious person was thinking to himself, if, if Jesus was really a prophet and if he really knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let that happen. And Jesus challenged this man for his hidden thoughts. And what he told him is, he who has been forgiven little, loves little. So the next question is, how do I know that God will actually forgive me? And there's two things that I think are pivotal for us to understand. We find this in John's uh, uh, epistle, 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Two reasons you can know you're forgiven. One is because God is faithful. To him, it's a matter of character. He will not go back on his word. If you confess your sins, God says, as a matter of, of character, I will forgive you. But it doesn't stop there. It says God is also just. So how does that work? And the answer is, is that God sent his son Jesus to pay the price for all sins. To pay the price for all sins. Would it be just for God to demand two payments? Jesus and yours? God is faithful and God is just. And therefore we know we can trust him to forgive. Psalm 32 said this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you 
with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. This passage tells us that for forgiven people, people who have confessed their sins, that there comes this capacity for God to lead and guide their lives. And there's a kind of intelligence about it. And it's not related to your IQ. It's just that this is what's true. When we carry around unforgiven sin in our lives, there's a kind of guilt and a kind of shame that accompany that. And even if we try to deny it or hide it, it still is inside of us and it seeps into every part of our life. How many decisions have you made in your life where it felt like someone was pulling on a bridle with a bit in your mouth and you just went in that direction because you didn't feel worthy. You didn't feel you deserved it. You didn't feel you were good enough. You didn't feel you measured up. There's all kinds of people who this is their whole decision making. The way they go about it in life, they just, they're constantly reacting to their own sense of guilt and shame. And God says, that's no way to live your life. But once we accept his forgiveness, there's a kind of guidance that he begins to provide for us. When we realize we have failed, here's my encouragement to you. Don't blow up. Don't cover up. Don't back up. Don't give up. Wake up. Wake up to the grace that God offers. So what happens when we do confess our sins? This is what happens. There's a release of the pressure that we have created upon ourselves. Our guilt begins to dissolve. Our sin disappears. And the, prob the process teaches us very important truths about God. So God desires us to confess our faults. There's one other thing that God desires us to confess, and that is our faith. God desires us to confess our faith. In Romans, the 10th chapter, it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So if you believe in your heart, what does that mean? Because a lot of us wonder if we've really believed enough. And believe just simply means that you trust something to be true. You're willing to put your confidence in that. And our behavior actually reveals what we think is true. You can't always tell what people think are true by the things they say, but you can tell what they think is true by the way that they act. For example, I was watching some of you as you came in this morning, and I didn't see anybody go to your chair and put a little pressure on it, a little more weight on it, and a little more weight on it, and then turn around and sit very gently to see if it would hold you up. Nope, you plopped yourself down with a kind of reckless abandon that put you at risk if that chair couldn't hold your weight. That's what you did, why? Because you had confidence, right? Most of you drove here this morning. You got in a car and you believed that the roads would be passable and that the ice would be melted by salt trucks and the snow would be plowed away. And beyond that, you actually believed that other drivers were going to follow the rules of the road. And if you don't believe any of that, you're home. By the way, welcome to those of you who are watching online. <laughs> yeah. You get in an airplane. An airplane weighs 90,000 pounds. That's not including the 40,000 pounds of fuel that they use to get it from point A to B. And that doesn't include the 45,000 pounds of human weight and all the luggage that they bring. And some people look like they're moving. They just bring all kinds of stuff. And we believe. 
and the laws of aerodynamics. We believe in the mechanics and the engineering. We believe that the pilot is going to be able to do his job. We believe that the mechanics are all going to function as they're supposed to. And we just walk in and the only thing that we can think about is, is we're wondering if we're going to get a cup of coffee because you can't get anything else on a plane anymore. We trust the design. And what Romans tells us is, put your confidence in God. When you trust yourself in life, you might be able to pull that off for a while, but eventually the anxiety starts to grow and you cannot quiet it. You might put your trust in someone else. You might put your trust in something else. But at the end of the day, there's only one person that can handle all the pressure and all the responsibility of being God in your life, and that happens to be God. Let God be God. And then believe in your heart. What's your heart? It's the center of your being. Over 800 times the word heart is used in Scripture. It's never once used to describe the physical organ that pumps blood to the various parts of your body. It is always used to describe this connection between the physical and the spiritual, the center of your life. So in the center of your life, trust God. 1 Samuel tells us that God actually doesn't look at our outward appearance. He looks at our heart. That's a fascinating thing. David would even say this, search my heart, O God. Have you chosen to trust that God raised Jesus from the dead and he is Lord? Paul wrote to the Romans, declare with your mouth. What does that mean? Confess. It means to agree. Agree with God, to say the same thing. God says Jesus is Lord. Do we ever agree with God or not? To say the same thing as God says about Jesus. At the end of the day, that's all confession is. It's speaking the truth. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Speaking what is true. Here's what's true. We have all failed. Here's what's true. God has provided a way of salvation. That's what's true. And for over 2,000 years, in every corner of our globe, there have been people who've stumbled across this truth. And instead of hiding the things that bring them shame, they make themselves transparent and vulnerable and they bring it out into the light. And what they discover is that lightning doesn't flash from heaven and the judgment of God roll down like thunder upon them. What they discover is that he forgives completely and fully. And that that story, that, that thing of which they were so ashamed, it's been redeemed from evidence that you're a failure to proof that God is good. And it becomes part of your testimony of grace. So this morning, I would like us to practice confession. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you a mic and ask you to start confessing all your faults. We don't have time for that today. <laughs> but I don't know another way increase our passion or our love for Jesus than to be completely honest with him about ourselves and watch what he does with that honesty. That's grace. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask you to read this out loud and together with me. Dear God, ready? Here we go. Dear God, here I am admitting I've messed up. I haven't been my best self, and sometimes I've hurt others and strayed from your path. I'm sorry for my mistakes and my mess-ups, both big and small. I'm sorry for what I have done and for what I have failed to do. Thank you for your endless patience and for always loving me, even when I falter. Please wipe my slate clean. Help me to start fresh 
and guide me to live more like you want me to, with kindness, love, and compassion in my heart. I am grateful for your forgiveness and for always being with me, showing me the way forward. Help me to reflect your love wherever I go. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing. Would you be willing to say with me, he is risen. Can we say that together? He is risen. One more. He is Lord. He is Lord. You have confessed your faults. You have confessed your faith. It's amazing what God does with the power of our confession.